Hi, so um, after my session on Sunday for the Aggression in Dogs conference, um, there were a number of questions that I wasn't able to answer. Uh, so I thought I'd make a video just answering some of those questions. The first question I have here um, is, uh, so what I'm hearing is that um, this is like teaching start button behaviors, the ability to opt out and take a break, or am I missing something? So definitely um, some of the things that we talked about included having the ability for the dog to opt in, to have ways of saying, I'm going to access other reinforcers and take a break. So we definitely discussed that during the session. Another question we have is, this is all great. I agree for lots of dogs, but what if you're working with a dog who is super sensitive to being pushed and every wrong move in the past has resulted in worse behavior the next time? Any thoughts on that? By wrong, I mean, if any kind of stress signal is given and we didn't immediately leave, the dog would get worse. So um, I think if you have the data to show you that if under these conditions, it's going to um, promote behaviors that you don't want to see um, and reinforce behaviors that you don't really want in the future, then you want to try and avoid them as much as possible. So definitely with your dog, um, having ways for your dog to be able to say or communicate, um, I'd like space or I need to move away is going to be really useful. What I would suggest is if you have a dog that um, needs to be able to leave the room, um, then we set the environment up so that in practice sessions, in training sessions, we're able to empower the learner by moving away. But I would say add in lots of other ways for the dog to be able to say, I'd like space. So rather than just, I need to get out of that door, go back to the car, we can also teach going from station to station. So you have two mats and the dog goes from one mat to the other mat. It could have a version of the bucket game, we can incorporate chin rest type behaviors. So now rather than the dog just having one way to say I need space, the dog has multiple ways of saying I need space. And um, that way, uh, hopefully we're allowing the learner to be more empowered. And sometimes what I've seen with dogs as well, is you have a dog who goes, I need to leave and they need to go all the way to a car by giving multiple ways of them being able to have a voice, to be able to have a conversation um, and that it's listened to, is that if one signal doesn't work, um, then they have other ways of being able to engage in that conversation. Um, and then also having those multiple ways, you start finding the dog doesn't have to go as far in, from a distance perspective. That sometimes just being in the same room, but disengaging and turning away is sufficient enough for them to be able to go, okay, I can come back and do this again. What happens if you have little control over the environment at the vet hospital and your pet has a single learning event? So there's a couple of elements to that question. I really like the question as well. The first one I would say is what happens if you have little control over the environment um, at the vets? So I would say um, one of the things we want to think about is how can we increase the amount of control that we could potentially have? Um, and so that's about setting our environment up for success. Um, so if we're able to, we can uh, select the best vet practice for our individual dog. And if we have multiple dogs, it may be different vet practices. The reason I say that is I've got two dogs, one dog, he can go to the vets pretty much anywhere. It could be a small consult room. It could be lots of barky lungy dogs. Um, it could be um, a main busy high street. We have to walk past to get there. Um, we don't require much outdoor space. Whereas my other dog um, at the moment, I would um, be setting up for, for failure if I was put her in that situation. So for her, a better vet practice is one that I could pull into that would have a car park um, or space where I could park where it's a bit quieter um, I would be looking at somewhere where I can walk to relatively quickly from where I park the car to get into a practice so we don't come across too many other dogs um, it may be I'd like a practice with some outdoor space uh, where the vet is happy to come and con consult in the car park maybe or at the car as opposed to just in the consult room uh, the consult room or the waiting room has space um, and so uh, potentially I have different criteria that I would be looking for for my different dogs and so what I would want to do is kind of shop around. And in the UK, we have lots and lots of vet practices. Um, and so and different vet practices are built in different ways, different staffing structure, different belief systems. And so um, I think that one of the things we can do is have control by um, kind of doing our shopping, um, looking around, doing our research, um, working out what's going to be the best for our learners.
Another aspect of that is also setting up the veterinary staff for success, as well as our pets. And so um, we can increase the amount of control we could have in those situations by um, going and doing booking in a vet appointment um, when my dog, I don't even have to, I don't take my dog. So I can just, that first vet appointment is just talking to the vets, making sure they're happy. You can understand, maybe show them some videos of what I've been doing with my dog, what they can expect, and then booking another consult in. And I'll pay for these consults. Um, and and um, there's no stress to go, I need to, for the vet to check the dog's ears or do a vaccination or do whatever they need to do. Um, and then the next few appointments can almost be building that relationship up. Uh, so then when I do have to take my dog, we've kind of arranged the environment to have more control in those environments. Obviously, things can go out the window. So if your dog is really sick, uh, things may you may have to go to plan B. Um, it could be that um, the vet you've been working with is leaving or um, is off on holiday. Um, so again, you might counter those things by going, I'm not just going to have one vet um, that I'm going to put all my eggs in one basket. I'm going to put my eggs in multiple baskets. I might have more in this basket than this basket, but I do have a plan B in place. And that could be a different vet in the same practice. It could be a different vet in a different practice but you're kind of covering yourself um, and setting yourself up for success um, in terms of groomers or vets or dog, any kind of care type stuff for our dogs. So it allows us to have more control. The second part of that question was, if your pet has a single learning event, um, I think the other, my comment there would be, if the event has already happened, there's not much we can really do about it. The past is gone, we can't change it. Um, all we have is the present moment. Um, the future hasn't happened yet, but what we can do is focus on maximizing what we can do in the power of now, but also going, okay, so how can I arrange the environment to maybe set myself up for success for the future? Um, and I think sometimes, I kind of talked about this with Eva a little bit, I was kind of hinting to it, I don't know how clear I was when I was doing it, but um, I think with dogs, sometimes we over project and we place um, emotions and feelings and thoughts and what the dog is going through without actually really knowing. Um, and I don't know, like the dogs are designed to survive. Biology sets you up to kind of survive. Um, and I think we underestimate um, the credit we give to a lot of dogs. Um, we kind of look at, oh my God, my puppy had one bad event. He's ruined for the rest of his life. Or, oh my God, my dog got attacked or this bad thing happened. Or at the vets, my dog got really scared. They're, all, they're going to be traumatized and we create all these stories and i'm not saying sometimes they're not real sometimes these things don't play out these ways um but what i personally see in my practice or working with trainers uh working with caregivers is most of the cases that i see um i feel like more of it is the person's um a learning history as opposed to the dog. I think the dog has got way more resilience. And actually, if we take a step back and interfere less, the dog is like bounces back and is able to cope better than um, the person is. And so I, I think there's a huge element to that. So I do think um, be more open to going, hold on a second, how much is this really impacting my dog? Um, and if it has had an impact on your dog, that's okay. Okay, it happened, we, again, we can't change the past. So I would say, um, try and focus on a different perspective of looking at it. So rather than approaching um, the next trainer that you speak to, the next session that you do um, as going, or well, even your friend, when you tell that story, change the story, rather than going, so I took my dog to the vets and it was a really traumatizing experience and we had the worst experience, I'm gonna have to do all this training. Let's rephrase that to going, oh, I'm going to teach my dog. Um, I'm going to go and put some more trust in the trust account, being at the vets with my dog. And we're not, we don't put the energy into all the negative stuff, the stuff that happened last week. We take from that objectively what can be useful. So when I went to the vets last week and I walked past four dogs to get into the waiting room, um, I took my dog way longer to be able to eat a treat. So I'm going to find a way to be able to go into a waiting room where my dog sees less dogs. Is that I go and do a consult later at night? Do I speak to a vet practice if they're open 24 hours a day and say, I'll pay your higher consult fees to come after hours, but can I come after hours when there's less people coming in and out? If you don't have an emergency, I'll find a way to use that information rather than using the information and create a story that's going to impact negatively. Let's take useful information from that and go, how can I build 
build going forward with my dog. And the other thing is uh, potentially looking at, okay, so when I went last time or if something's just happened, a single event, um, rather than trying to recover from it or go, I need to change it quickly. Yesterday I went to the vet's, a bad thing happened. Um, I'm going to go to today. I'm going to feed my dog lots of treats. It may be worth just giving it a few weeks. Um, it may be worth just going, actually, I'm not going to go back for the next two or three days or next uh, six weeks, but then I'm going to go back six weeks later. I'm going to walk past the vets. As I walk past, I'm going to drop five meatballs and then carry on walking past. The next uh, few days later, I'm going to walk past open the door, walk in the waiting room, drop five more meatballs, let my dog eat them and then just go carry on my walk. Because sometimes I think we try to undo the bad thing that's happened and it's too late, it's happened already. So uh, if we, the more we try, sometimes we actually make it worse. Um, so I would say, yeah, give it a moment and then come up with what do I want to do? What do I want to teach my learner um, and come up with a plan to go forward from there. And Another part of that would also be, as I mentioned previously, um, is if it wasn't the right environment, find a different environment. Um, and again, you maybe say, actually, um, to find a different environment, it will take a two hour drive because it's the only vet I have. Um, and that's fine if, if you're restricted by uh, where you live or where you can take your dog, um, then, you, then you have limited options to work on. But lots of my clients, uh, lots of people I work with, they do have a few different options they can choose from. So I would say uh, we have options. Can you clarify the example of training a move away behavior and then taking it to the vets in case where the dog is already needing treatment for something? Um, like the bed and the snuffle mat example, would you take these items to the vets with you? Excellent question. Um, again, I think there's two components to that question. The first one was, can you clarify using the, you've taught the dog they can move to a different mat and taking that to the vets where the dog needs treatment? Yes. So um, first of all, if it's something my dog isn't set up for in terms of being able to be examined, let's, for example, let's just take uh, the dog's got a <coughs> an ear infection and um, you've been working on, you can move over there, you can be over here, the good things happen, but the reinforcement history for a stranger looking in ears or checking ears um, isn't um, sufficient yet to be able to use, there's probably no point putting the dog in that situation because what you're going to get is the dog wants to be over there. The vet's not really going to be able to have a look in the ear anyway. And so we haven't really set the environment up for success. So I would say that's not a time where I would put those things into place. Um, I would look at speaking to my vets and working out the best strategy to be able to a stressful way possible, um, but ask what's the best way we can help meet the dog's welfare needs and get them the treatment they need and having that conversation. But generally, yes, if my dogs are ready for certain things, that's why I would have my option to be able to move to a different station or a mat um, and then to be in front of me, I would have my snuffle mat or a, a Kong or something they can also go to if they wanted to. I would make it very reinforcing to engage in what we're doing in front over here because that's why you're at the vet. Um, and normally what I recommend to people, what I would take if I go to the vets is I take my dog's water bowl uh, because each water bowl is different. They'll smell different. Um, they're different materials, different heights. And so it's like having your favorite coffee mug. You're setting your environment for success. Uh, taking your own water. Um, and I don't mean buy a bottle of water on the way if your dog's not used to that. If your dog's used to drinking water from your tap, fill it up from the tap because water might smell different, have different uh, properties. Um, if it comes out of different taps, hard water, soft water, the water treatment in different boroughs or different areas might be different. So again, we're just setting the dog up for their favorite brand of coffee with their favorite coffee mug. Obviously don't give your dog coffee, but um, the analogy. I would also take some familiar objects. They could be anything from toys to uh, slippers or anything your dog finds as familiar to your dog that could function as oh this is relaxing has a reinforcement safety history um, it's something familiar something that creates a smile moment so for me when I, if we walk into a building somewhere or you see a friend that you weren't expecting go ah oh, what are you doing here I wasn't expecting to see you smile moment and so with my dog he walks into the vet's room or he comes out the car 
and he walks along as he's sniffing goes this is my toy how did I get there and he sees tail start wagging and go oh I've got fam- this is familiar it's a smile moment so the more smile moments we give um, then that could be really useful I'd have a bed or a mat or a blanket or something the dog can go to a non-slip surface so there and treats um, so they're the things that I would take in. Normally, I would wait in the car with my dog um, if that's an option. Um, I'd ask the vets to just let me know when they're ready. If the consult's happening outside, then I'd have the mat on the floor, the water bowl with water, some treats and some toys on the floor. Let the dog come out, sniff around. As they engage and they come to station, reinforce. And then I'd ask the vet, let me know when you want to do something or what you'd like to do. And if my dog's ready, I'll let you know. Uh, if my dog um, says they're not ready, if you could take your hands and just move them to your knee or move your hands to your waist or whatever you want to have. If my dog turns away or my dog um, looks up or moves his chin off the chair, hands to um, hands to lap. So then, and you can cue as you're going through this. And again, remember um, what I talked about earlier about setting your environment up for success and hopefully you've done work with the vets to, for this to be successful. Um, so that's, um, yeah, and that's what I would say. Also, I would say if I'm at the vets and I just see my dog start stiffening up a little bit, and again, I might take a treat at that moment and just toss it back on that mat and then feed a few on the mat so I can start to make move to that mat when there's tension, a reinforcing option, something that's available uh, for my dog. Um, another question we have is, how do you navigate this kind of cooperative care conversation uh, when your vets need to take the dog to the back to do some kind of testing um, or um, do some kind of procedure? Um, understanding they're just trying to do their job, uh, but what if your dog has a um, history of being fearful? It's a great question. So I think some of the things I've mentioned already about um, how we arrange the environment for success by selecting the vet practice, the vets you go to, the vets who you're going to work with, all of those different options will kind of help you set you up for success. Generally, I tend to ask my vets, I'd like to be with my dog most of the time when they've had x-rays or procedures. Often my dogs are either given their pre-med or sedated while they're with me. They're lying on their bed next to me in the waiting room. And then once they're asleep, the vets pick them up and take them to the back and do what they need to do. And even waking up, I've had times where as the dog is um, becoming um, more conscious again, they've allowed me to be there. And so um, the dog wakes up and there's someone familiar um, there with the dog. But again, it's about building those relationships and um, having those conversations. Um, and again, I think if we do them in the moment when um, you've taken your dog, they need to do um, some treatments or they need to do certain th- things and they've got a whole backlog of appointments, emergencies, that may not be the right environment to start having that conversation. Um, so again, as I mentioned previously, uh, set your environment up for success by selecting when you have those conversations because it will make it easier when you do have to take your dog in. As a pet owner, what are good resources to begin training cooperative care with? Um, so um, I would say uh, the bucket game uh, is something I would recommend looking up. Uh, Laura Monaco Torelli has amazing YouTube videos. Um, clickertraining.com has a course on husbandry behaviors. Ken Ramirez has lots of stuff on husbandry behaviors. Um, <coughs> uh, pardon me. Um, Deb Jones, um, I think, has a book on um, husbandry type behavior, animal care behaviors. Uh, Sophia Yin has a book on uh, sort of safe restraints, um, lower stress handling. Um, so there's many different resources out there. Even if you sort of kind of Google um, low stress handling, um, there's a fear free program, of course, as well. Um, so there's many lots, many, many, many different resources um, that people can um, go to nowadays. And just even by Googling, like I say, low stress handling, um, you'll start to see um, different options and tutorials and ideas that you can just start to pick out nuggets think the things that you're happy to do and kind of start growing and evolving uh, from that just pick one little thing to start practicing with and then build on that uh, what's one way you would explain to the average dog owner about how cooperative care can benefit them the slow pacing of gaining um, the operations down with the dog and the humans can be slow at times and a low rate of reinforcement for the human Again, a wonderful question. Um, so I would say, um, I like, so there can be some generic ideas, but 
every caregiver is going to be different. Their resources they have available, their learning histories um, and timelines, all of those different things are going to be. So what could be reinforcing for one person may not be reinforcing for another person's behavior. So I would say um, looking at the individual in front of me, what I would do is um, start to observe. And um, if I hear one person say, oh it's such a pain to get my dog's uh, collar and lead on then for me that could be a great environmental arrangement to start um for to introduce husbandry type behaviors i think that could be useful for husbandry um, but that's going to be reinforcing to the caregiver too so working on being able to click the collar and lead on while the dog is staying calm and happy um, but also going well, okay it's not a collar and lead but how about we try putting a sock on or we try putting um, a bit of vet wrap um, around um, different parts of the dog's body so um, essentially for the client I can explain to them like it's not the, it's not the same as a collar because it, it's not well, it's not the same as a physical collar, but actually if your dog's learning to be calm and relaxed while you can do lots of these different things, then imagine how easy it's going to be to put the collar and lead on. So um, it could be another client says, oh, my dog, is, uh, he gets so muddy and wet and I want him to be clean when he comes in the house. That's another opportunity to start introducing husbandry behaviours. If I have... Um, a client who wants to dress their dog up, then being able to do that in a way where the dog actually doesn't really care, um, is voluntary, positive, and the animal's relaxed, um, and let's do dress up type stuff. So um, just introduce uh, husbandry behaviors, but in a way that the caregiver finds it reinforcing. Other ways I've done it as well, um, and that's one reason behind the bucket game is a lot of caregivers found being able to teach their dog to be uh, stationary in front of food and be calm, um, keeping the head away from the food was really reinforcing for a lot of people, uh, more so than doing husbandry behaviors. But if they're doing, uh, can you have the bucket there with food in front of you? And the distraction is, can I touch your ear? Can I put your lead on and off? Can I touch? your leg um, they might be focusing on look how long my dog can stay while all these things happen when there's food in front of them but their dog is getting lots of ways or they're getting lots of ways to be able to do husbandry behaviors with their dogs too um, so there's different ways to introduce that and I kind of look for what's reinforcing for the caregivers uh, when I introduce that another question we have is suggestions for a dog who is very reactive at the vet's um, office since having his anal glands expressed now he will not tolerate nail trims um, or most handling uh, she's muzzled for safety however due to her size and strength staff are not able to trim her nails or perform physical exams. Uh, we tried medication uh, prior to her last appointment. However, it was unsuccessful. Um, owner is still practicing handling daily in the home. Um, last resort is sedation, but due to existing heart condition, uh, we don't want to necessarily go down this route. Um, we're thinking about trying um, nail trims in a different location. What are your thoughts? So I think there's lots of really cool points in that. So you mentioned about muzzles. Uh, so sometimes um, another option to muzzles and not because muzzles aren't good. Muzzles are great if you can train them, find the right muzzle for your dog. Um, not, but some dogs have learned muzzle comes on as a predictor of aversives, um, ability not to be able to escape from a situation. Um, so if that's the case, then rather than retraining the muzzle, which may take longer, or you can always retrain the muzzle, but in the side, you might need something short term. I've used things like baby gates, play pens um, or crates where the dog goes into the crate or behind one side of the play pen or um, behind a baby gate and we teach them like you would with a zoo animal wild animal to come to the fence and present different body parts and then the dog has more space um, it's still protected contact um, so that could be one option and it also removes a cue of something negative might be going to happen if that's what um, the muzzle has started predicting so it allows you to change the environment in another way prior to the last appointment medication still wasn't successful so again as a non-vet i would say maybe worth speaking to your vets because they may actually go oh okay so this medication didn't work as well as we wanted or because of this environmental arrangement um, how about we try something different um, and so them knowing um, obviously the veterinary history and um, uh, the veterinary stuff and um, the um, medication side of things they'll be able to go uh, actually rather than ruling it out there are actually good other safe options we could try 
And it could also be that situations where dogs have had medications before, but they were really stressed or when they got the medication and then the car journey, seeing other dogs in the way, um, those things just made the dog more stressed and it, the medication wasn't as, um, as successful as, as you may have had if the dog was way calmer in those situations. So teaching uh, sort of condition relaxation um, could be really useful. But again, it would definitely worth having that conversation with, uh, with your vets. Um, and then I like your idea of should we try the nail trim in a different um, a different location? And I would say think location more broadly. So a lot of times people will say, well, I trained it in the living room, but I decided in the bathroom now because it's different. But remember, for our learners, it's not just the room. Um, it could be that um, it's the treat bag, it's the clicker, it's you saying lie down, stay, and then you go to touch the paw. But lie down, stay has already become a cue for potential aversives that are going to happen. So when you change the environment environment think about the environment at large not necessarily just that room and so the changes you're going to make and that's why I like the bucket game a lot and why I designed it in that way was because a lot of dogs don't experience having a bunch of food in front of you getting fed for looking towards the location of the food and then um, introducing that because that kind of changed the picture sufficiently enough and you remove any kind of obediency verbal cues that could have become poison cues or cues for uh, sort of punishers um, and so um, um, thinking a bit more broadly in terms of location might be helpful as well. So um, hopefully I've been able to answer some more of the questions that we didn't get a chance to answer um, during our session on Sunday. Um, and hopefully um, there's some food for thought there and it's helped clarify some of the things that we talked about. Um, so happy training, um, go enjoy your dogs, uh, practice lots of caregiving behaviors. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, listen to this.